Space is a big place, and it's quite a relative term if you think about it. It can refer to this space between myself and my wonderfully seated audience, which is you guys right in front of me, or it can mean the vast expanse made up of vacuum and dissipated particles in between galaxies, as you guys can see in this picture back here. Now, when taking into consideration that you guys, the audience, isn't going to be as interested in, let's say, the seats or the stage or the st speakers that separate you from me, we're going to be taking into account the more astronomical version of space for this talk, the universe around us. Now, the space industry, too, like other industries right here on Earth, has some overarching objectives that it hopes to accomplish. Two of the most common ones that it has been implementing for a long time and will continue to do so in the future as well are as follows. Number one is to deploy space missions to directly help and benefit the people back here on Earth. Number two is to colonize another planet in the near vicinity of the Earth in case some sort of impending doom is coming towards the Earth that we just can't avoid, okay? So, um, some of you guys, some of you eagle-eyed guys in the audience might have noticed that I never explicitly mentioned space exploration. I mean, you guys might be wondering if this kid's going to be talking about space, he's probably going to be talking about something related to exploration, like planets or like the traces of life in the solar system or something like that. But no, I have, an I have a definition for exploration that I carry around and talk about it to everybody who I'm talking, about, uh, uh, talking to about this topic. According to me, Exploration is basically when, uh, when someone goes into uncharted territory to find out or discover something for the greater good of a larger community. Uh, and according to me, that is what the space industry is doing, uh, taking forward with these two objectives that I just mentioned. Plus, if you gave me the chance to talk about all the scientific and technical advancements of the last 50 years, we'll be here all evening, so we don't want that. So, uh, before we venture into the future, let us take a step back and understand what are some real-life applications of the current-day spaceflight industry. So, has everybody heard of Hurricane Irma? Wow, that, wow. <laughs> you guys might be living under a rock or something. Anyways, uh, uh, so yeah, well, there's a lot of hurricanes happening in the uh, Caribbean island section, but for this example, let us just consider Hurricane Irma. So, we predicted it. We predicted it, its severity, had time to evacuate the good people of Florida, and also had time to give it a fancy name, Irma. How? Some of you guys might ask. Well, it's because of the hundreds of weather satellites that operate approximately 36,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, giving us stunning aerial images of the planet. Uh, using these images, the meteorologists or the ecologists or the boys back in the lab, as some people like to call them, uh, uh, analyze these images and understand the different weather patterns or natural calamities or other events that might occur to us. Even the most simplest of tasks, such as finding a good day to go to Universal Studios, also has uh, I know, uh, space flight playing an important role in it. Another aspect, uh, another application that directly stems from the current day spaceflight industry is GPS, or the Global Positioning Systems, which gives the layman access to complex navigation services and route planning services. So this diagram behind me may look kind of complicated, but what it's actually trying to say is that all these satellites are connected to all the vehicles like cars, ships, uh, planes, and all of that, and are constantly giving them real-time data. GPS itself has provided us with so much uh, of data and applications that we're currently using in today, uh, today's current life. So one of them is the Uber taxi service. If you think about it, Uber taxi service wouldn't even be possible without the GPS systems. Another application that might sound far-fetched but is actually in progress right the second is the driverless cars made by Tesla Motors. These cars can take this real-time traffic and navigational data and transfer it into a software and drive themselves. Best part is, they can even parallel park, which is pretty cool if you think, if you think about it. Now, the next part is the most interesting part, okay? It's, it sits about 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, orbiting Earth once every 90 minutes. It's the size of two football fields and is, is the most expensive man-made object ever built the International Space Station, or the ISS. Now, the International Space Station itself is a fantastic megastructure, which is 
a piece of human engineering and ingenuity that is unmatched by any other. If you think about it, uh, there's about six laboratories on that thing, and that it helps us to understand how real-life space travel will be possible in the future. Now, two implications or two applications directly stem from the International Space Station itself, both of them concerning in the medical industry right here on Earth. Number one is this thing, laser eye surgery. Now, I'm pretty sure everybody here has heard of laser eye surgery, but just a little bit of background is that laser eye surgery is when your uh, vision sort of get dis gets distorted, and you do this laser eye surgery thing, and you get your HD vision back, which is pretty cool. Now, laser eye surgery wasn't a technology that was originally adopted across the Earth, but it was a technology that was first sent up to the International Space Station to test the astronauts' reference frame, eye movement, and their balance in the weightless environment of space. After assessing these things, uh, or these factors, the, uh, the, the space industry decided that it would be good to use this in the form of laser eye surgery in large proportions back here on Earth. Another factor is this, the Canada arm, which was sent up to the International Space Station by, let me see, Canada, it's in the name. So, Canada arm uh, was sent up to the International Space Station to assemble the space station in space. This is because Although our rockets are pretty cool at the moment, we can't send such big things up to space, okay? We need to go assemble them in space through, uh, through the course of different, various different rocket launches. Well, this Canada arm helped us do that. Now, a smaller version of this Canada arm is currently helping us uh, uh, to operate on malignant and benign tumors here on Earth. Now, agreed that uh, organics and actual trained surgeons can do this, but they can never achieve the actual precision or accuracy that a machine can offer. So there. We have now established how current day space flight is inevitably helping the people back here on Earth. So, if there's one thing I want every single person in the audience right now to take away from this talk or from the babbling that I've been doing for the last eight seconds is to have an amazing appreciation for that phone in your pocket. Because that phone, think about it, is what connects you to the vast array of the applications that I just mentioned, such as GPS or weather, or even those amazing pictures of space that keep floating around on the internet. So there you go. So now we've talked enough about the past, and let's transition into the future, because I said so. Okay, we are now in the future. So in the future, well, we, the future, the second part that I wanted to talk about is the second objective of the spaceflight industry, which is to colonize a nearby planet. The obvious candidate is Mars. Mars. How do we get there? Good question. Better question is, what do we do before we even think about going there? You see, before we go to Mars, there's some factors that we need to consider. Why Mars? What is so special about Mars? that every person or every uh, major industry or uh, space agency is trying to colonize it. What's so special about the red planet that everybody wants to go there? Well, it's because of the striking similarities between the Earth and the Mars that make it so desirable. So let's get some hard facts to the table here and discuss them first. Mars' diameter is approximately 6,000 kilometers, whereas the Earth's diameter is approximately 12,000 kilometers. Now, you guys might be wondering, bro, you just talked about similarities, and now you're introducing a, a difference that is literally about double the size of Mars. That can't be possible. Well, if you think about it, Earth's oceans make up most of its diameter as well, because we have vast oceans on the planet. You take out the oceans, and you're left with the land mass, or the land diameter of the planet, which is also only about 6,000 kilometers, exactly equivalent to Mars. How is this beneficial for us, and how does that make Mars an ideal colonization location? Is because if you take, in, in the distant future, this isn't happening now, but if you take all the population of the Earth and transport it to Mars, we'll be able to, we'll be, we'll be able to live there, because well, we, if we can fit all the population in a 6,000 kilometer diameter here on Earth, we'll be able to do the same on Mars itself. Another factor is the tilt, or the axis, on which Mars, Mars and Earth are. Well, Mars, uh, well, if I have to give you a visual representation of how this works, it's not that both of all these planets orbit around the sun like this. It's more like they orbit like this. There's a slight tilt in their axis which makes them have seasons. So Earth is tilted on a 23 degree axis and Mars is tilted on a 25 degree axis. Very small shift, doesn't really matter that much in terms of the seasons. 
This gives us seasons such as uh, summer, winter, fall, autumn, all of this. And if Earth is tilted on its axis and has seasons, then Mars, if it is tilted, will also have seasons, which is pretty cool, which makes it more adaptable for human life to exist there. Now, the only factor that prevents us from actually going to Mars and having be a Sunday drive location where you just go, land on Mars, take off your helmet, and run across the red planet like, uh, like Alex the Lion from Madagascar, is the fact that Earth and Mars have very, very different atmospheres, or very differing atmospheres in a lot of ways. Earth's diameter, uh, just for reference, has about 1% carbon dioxide, about 79% nitrogen, and about 20% of oxygen, or the stuff of life, or the stuff that we need to th survive or thrive on a planet. You flip those per percentages around, and you get Mars's atmosphere. You get approximately 96% carbon dioxide and 4% of other miscellaneous gases. This makes Mars an uninhabitable location if you just want to go there without your spacesuit. It, it makes the atmosphere of Mars nearly unbreathable. Therefore, before we even send people to Mars and before we even land people on Mars, what space industries uh, or space agencies such as NASA, ESA, and SpaceX want to do is establish these things called planetary habitats. Now, these things are huge enclosed spaces which are completely oxygenated and have provisions such as food and water and are basically these huge outposts on Mars. So that when, when the actual people are launched from here on Mars and they land on Mars, they can disembark their vessel and head into this where they can carry out their astronautical, astronomical duties and uh, scientific experiments and everything. And they're not just confined to their 4x4 four four space of the capsule. So, now, let's get back to the uh, original question that we had in the beginning. How do we get there, right? That was the original question we had. And before I cut you off saying, what do we do before we even think about going there? But the original question was, how do we get there? Well, if I had to give you a very simple answer, if I had to take, about, take out all the uh, orbital mechanics or physics or mathematics, I would just say stuff a bunch of astronauts in a capsule and propel it to Mars when the time is right. But we all know that's not how it works. Or is it? Well, if you think about it, vacuum is very, it doesn't have any resistance. If you put anything in a vacuum and accelerate it towards a target, it's going to keep going. There's nothing to stop it. So the propulsion power, or the power required to accelerate this object from one place to another, isn't the problem. The problem is, how are we going to make the people who are going to Mars survive the journey to Mars? Because although space might look like this twinkly paradise that everybody loves, we all know that is one of the most hostile and volatile environments known to man. All right? It is, there's so many things that are so harmful to the humans that are going on certain trips, uh, long distance trips from Earth to different planets. There's cosmic radiation, there's micrometeorites, there's solar flares, there's all sorts of problems. And the distance between Earth and Mars is approximately 225 million kilometers, an unprecedented distance that our astronauts would have to travel. And to get there, an average spacecraft would take about seven months, or about 200 days. And that is a long time to be battling the obstacles that are thrown at you by space. So before we even go there, there's two more factors that we need to consider, out of the many that other scientists are considering, but there's two more factors that we need to consider about how do we make the people who are going to Mars stay alive on the journey to Mars. So number one is cosmic radiation. So cosmic radiation is radiation that is being spewed across the universe through different mediums, such as black holes, pulsars, and even our sun itself. Our sun is throwing radiation. And this sort of radiation often comes and hits Earth as well. This radiation is possible, and it, it has the capability to rip through your DNA and cause cancer. So how do we not get affected by it here on Earth? Well, it's because of our amazing magnetosphere, or a magnetic field. But well, what this does is when the actual radiation waves comes towards the Earth, it redirects these uh, waves and pushes them outward, which never even comes into the atmosphere and affects us. So let's just imagine a situation where we have our astronauts heading up to uh, the atmosphere's end and actually making orbit. They're going through the atmosphere, they're going through the magnetosphere, and as soon as they es escape the magnetosphere, no more protection. They're being bombarded by these radiation waves, which are not good for their health. Good thing is, scientists are actually working on this as a problem that they're, they're trying to tackle so that we can actually go on long-duration missions. The solution that they have is not permanent, as it is not viable, 
but they're currently saying that enriched titanium is the proper material that they can use to uh, protect us from these radiation waves. Although this is not the most cost effective, neither it is the most light material that we can use. The second factor that is going to greatly influence our going to Mars is going to be micrometeorites. Micro, meaning small, and meteorites, meaning those pesky little things littered across the solar system that travel at whopping speeds. And by whopping speeds, I don't just mean speeds that are like the average truck that you see outside. These things travel at 25 to 32 kilometers per second, which is extremely fast, and it can rip through your spacecraft to shreds. It can rip, to, it can rip your spacecraft to shreds in about a fraction of a second, which is extremely fast. So good thing is scientists have already figured out ways to eliminate this possibility, as they're saying, we're going to use two sheets of aluminum at a particular distance. The first sheet of aluminum is going to absorb the damage, and the second sheet of aluminum is actually going to protect the hull of the ship. However, this isn't the most proper uh, kind of uh, method we have developed yet, and scientists are still rigorously working on better ways to actually improve our life. So after doing all of this, after figuring out all, after understanding all the unprecedented discoveries that our predecessors have given us, after understanding all the real life applications of the space industry, after understanding why Mars is one of the most habitable places that we can go to and what makes Mars and Earth so similar, after understanding and actually rectifying the fact that we uh, can actually go to Mars and how to make people survive on the journey to Mars, we get to Mars. We look at Mars from about 4,000 kilometers away, its atmosphere glistening in the sunlight. We enter the gentle atmosphere of Mars, and we land on Mars. The first human steps foot on Mars. This human would have gone further and faster than any human in history. And as soon as he steps foot on Mars, he's going to start a Cold War. However, don't get me wrong, this Cold War isn't going to be a war of Russia trying to fight the US or vice versa. This is going to be a war of humans trying to wrestle space in a cosmic ballet that is going to result in unprecedented scientific discoveries and advancements. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what I call space exploration. When somebody puts themselves into uncharted territory to find out or discover something good for the greater good of, of, of a larger community, which is the entire human race itself. That is what space exploration is. Thank you.